Okay, case 17. So we have kind of a nodular proliferation with a lot of blood in the superficial to mid dermis. Looks pretty cellular from here with yeah. some poorly formed vascular spaces. And again, just impressed by the amount of hemorrhage we have within this. Yeah. Seeing signs of hyperchromasia, maybe as we go in more, some nuclear atypia. It's giving me sarcomatous vibes. Uh, very poorly formed little small vascular spaces. Um, I'm presuming they're that. They're vacuolated areas, yeah. but presuming yeah, small vessels. So angiosarcoma is what I'm afraid of here, especially with all the hyperchromatic nuclei. And as we go closer, you yeah. can see more atypia. Oh, we got these, mitosis, so. probably an atypical mite up there. Hard to tell in this scan. Lots of little capillary, uh, evacuated looking vascular channel spaces, poorly formed, like you said. We can get areas that are kind of solid sheet like nodules of epithelioid cells. And sometimes they'll be hyperchromatic. Other times they'll have like a pale vesicular chromatin, but, but very large nuclei, way bigger than normal endothelial cells should look like much of the time. Big nucleoli, uh, pleomorphism, mitotic activity, and, you know, the growth pattern being uh, one thing we don't like to see infiltrative growth, interconnected anastomotic channels, especially when there's atypia. And then again, like we've talked about many times uh, together, the, the clinical context is really important um, in angiosarcoma to see how it looked clinically and also what, what kind of patient and where on the body it is and what their history is. So um, if we're, we're not always given all of that information, but that's something that if we're thinking of angiosarcoma, it's worth spending some time to try to figure that out if we're struggling in a hard case. Here, it's so ugly and we've got nice vasoformation. I think there's no question in this particular case. Um, but let me go up to lower power here. One thing from low power that strikes me is it kind of looks like a pyogenic granuloma, lobular capillary hemangioma from real low power. Much more cellular than usual, right? But it's a nodule with a collarette. So that I would say is not real, this, this particular growth pattern, I've not seen that often in angiosarcoma. So that could be confusing at first. And when you look closer, this is super ugly compared to even a pretty revved up PG, not going to look this ugly and this solid and, and cellular, okay? And, and not going to use up atypical mitotic figures. The other thing is let's look at our context. Where is this coming from and what's going on in the background? We've got dilated vascular or lymphatic spaces, some of which have atypical endothelial cells bulging into the lumen. So this may actually be a part of a more subtle example of the background angiosarcoma, or maybe it's not. Maybe it's a change from previous radiation uh, here. Like that's, look that, that's good. This is an infiltrative vascular channel. So sometimes the more solid nodules of angiosarcoma can be really challenging, especially when you can't see vasoformation or don't have much blood. So not all angiosarcomas will be very bloody. There are times where you can have almost no blood and very solid growth of epithelial cells. And those are incredibly treacherous because they can mimic melanoma or poorly differentiated carcinoma on H and E, and you need immunostains to solve it, which is why in older sun damaged people and a poorly differentiated tumor, I basically always am trying to keep in my initial differential, think of angiosarcoma and include an ERG or a CD31, um, unless I've got something else to prove otherwise. Um, and they can, angiosarcs can express keratin, so that can be further treacherous because it can make you think there could be carcinoma. But here we have a vascular channel infiltrating the dermis lined by very atypical hobnailed endothelial cells bulging into and kind of floating into the lumen there and more there. So these sneaky vessels can be very challenging on an excision because they can trickle out towards the edges and sometimes they can stray far from where the main tumor mass seems to end. Angiosarcomas are usually infiltrative. I have seen exceptions that were nodular and not infiltrative, but I would say the majority are infiltrative and so local control can be really problematic in addition to the worry about metastases. In this setting, though, if we ignore the angiosarc and just look at the background, we've got away from the angiosarc stuff that doesn't look like tumor, but has big dilated vascular or lymphatic channels, hemorrhage, incredibly dense sclerotic abnormal collagen. This is not normal dermis. This is like hyalinized sclerotic collagen with blood and hemorrhage and hemosiderin and dilated lymphatic spaces and vessels. This person has probably received radiation therapy. So learning to recognize the homogenized sclerotic dermis and the lymphatic stasis changes, because remember, 
lymphedema occurs in the context of radiation therapy. That's what radiation scars the dermis and gives it this sclerosis. And also because of that scarring, it blocks off lymphatics. So you tend to get lymphedema change hand in hand with the sclerosis that you get in radiation. So it's really helpful clue that when I see sclerosis and lymphangiectasia, and sometimes you'll see hyperchromatic enlarged spindle or stellate cells scattered in the dermis, which represent what we call radiation fibroblasts or reactive radiation induced atypia. You don't always see that, but sometimes you do. That triad of features um, should right away, even if you've not been told the history, you should suspect radiation history and go look it up. And then that's going to be, then I'm very worried if I see a, an atypical looking vascular proliferation in the setting of a radiated background. That's very concerning, obviously, for angiosarcoma. So that's what's happened here. This patient had radiation. I don't know why in this case, but they had radiation with really severe radiation associated reactive changes in the background. And then in that context, they had a post-radiation angiosarcoma arise. And what's the molecular abnormality that most post-radiation angiosarcomas have? Um, uh, that we don't tend to see as often in sporadic, you know, uh, uh, angiosarc and sun damaged skin. C-MIC. Yeah, C-MIC amplification is present in the majority of post-radiation and also lymphedema associated um, angiosarcoma. Very good.